Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Gregerson and I'd like to talk to you about the Book of Abraham and how it was translated. There's a lot of critics out there that are trying very hard to confuse you, but they have nothing to offer you folks. They can repeat the same thing a hundred times, but that doesn't make it true. They'll tell you that Joseph Smith didn't do anything right as far as the translation. You know, you've all heard it before, but they can say that a hundred times, but don't believe it. It's false. And I'm going to show you tonight a lot of new evidence that you probably haven't seen that'll change your mind. One hardship for Joseph Smith is that the prophecies declared him to be unlearned and unable to translate the Egyptian without divine revelation. His scribes for translating the gold plates were not allowed to see the plates, nor the Egyptian characters which left him all alone to convince the world. This really got difficult when mobs tarred and feathered him, calling him a false prophet because he couldn't explain this reformed Egyptian. Not wanting to appear as unlearned, he vigorously learned Hebrew and graduated first in his class. But when the Book of Abraham scrolls came on the scene, everybody, the saints, the neighbors, the scribes, and everybody could see the Egyptian characters that he was to translate. This time would be far different. The scribes testified that they sat right next to Joseph Smith and watched him translate the Egyptian characters as they wrote down the translation. The scribes and Joseph Smith together obviously saw this arrangement as a way to prove the Egyptian language to the whole world because God, through Joseph Smith, was transforming Egyptian into English right before their eyes. And they could actually see it happening as the scribes. This was a big chance to use this experience to create an Egyptian alphabet and grammar system. At no time did the Lord command them to use the scrolls to figure out the Egyptian language, but he obviously let them try their plan. So right in the text, the Lord tells Abraham to teach about his seed that multiply like the stars in heaven and teach only those words to the Egyptians, not anything else. This is about the gospel of Abraham in the book of Abraham. It has nothing to do with Egyptian. So if God tells Abraham to only teach about his future seed, which is Israel and his people, why are these Egyptian gods and these hieroglyphics in the book of Abraham? So in the book, you've got this fake representation of these hieroglyphs in a false religion, contrasted over here with the gospel of Abraham, the true gospel. But you have these numbers that show the counterfeiting of God's gospel, according to the Egyptians. But this whole message is about the Abrahamic covenant, about the words of Abraham, not about the Egyptian. So the prophet in Abraham 1 and 14 tells us the reason they placed these Egyptian figures into the book was to help us understand how false gods are fashioned. In other words, how they're counterfeited. Can't understand why critics don't read the text. It says the Egyptian pharaohs copied or counterfeited the gospel of Noah and they led people away into idolatry. This is a false gospel. It's not about an Egyptian understanding. Did the Lord really expect Abraham to teach the Egyptians biblical words written in a non-biblical language and understanding? So if the Lord translated the book of Abraham, it's certainly not going to translate into Egyptian gods and Egyptian words. It's going to be translated into the book of Abraham and Abraham's seed, which are as numerous as the stars in heaven. This is a false gospel. It's not about an Egyptian understanding. So right in the text, the Lord tells Abraham to teach about his seed that multiply like the stars in heaven and teach only those words to the Egyptian. So here's the question no one seems to be asking. If Abraham is commanded to teach from the astronomy that relates only to his posterity, which is Israel, then how are Joseph Smith and his scribes going to translate a Hebrew message from the language of Egyptian characters who represent adultery, which is the language of the false gods. How are they going to translate from this? Did the Lord really expect Abraham to teach the Egyptians biblical words written in a non-biblical language and understanding? Sure enough, the book of Abraham was all about Adam and Noah and the biblical prophets related to the priesthood, not about the Egyptian hierarchy or priesthood at all. Let's say this is an Egyptian character that translates into the name Osiris by the Egyptologist. But the Lord God is not going to translate an Egyptian God into scripture. So he takes it to part C and translates it into the name Abraham. Let's say this Egyptian character here translates into the false god Horus. Who's false? The Lord God is not going to use him in scripture. So he retranslates it into the real God, Jesus Christ or Jehovah. Could the Lord do that? 
How could the critics expect the true prophet to take Egyptian mythology, which is fake, and translate it into the same fake mythology in English? No prophet would do that. A true prophet would take this and convert it into the true gospel, which is what the Abraham book is all about. From all the evidence, Joseph Smith and his scribes were trying to create their own Rosetta Stone. They were trying to take the alphabet of a known language and link it directly to the alphabet of the Egyptians. In other words, Joseph Smith and his scribes were trying to do what the Rosetta Stone does. It takes Egyptian characters and converts them into an exact alphabet. Now, there is no other possible way to do this other than the scribes putting their writing paper right next to the scroll, line per line. So because Joseph Smith starts translating from the very first line, they have an exact reference point right here to start writing the English translation on this side lined up exactly on the same line as the Egyptian. The question they may not have known, even though they started at the right reference point, could they continue the linking process all the way down the page with the English? This is the only way they could have done it. Don't forget the testimony of the scribes. They say they sat right next to Joseph and watched him translate right here. But here's one problem they undoubtedly ran into. They ran into these lacunas, these holes, these places where there was no writing like the Dead Sea Scrolls, who ran into the same problem. They had almost the same challenge with the Dead Sea Scrolls. There were dozens of lacuna gaps or holes where the language was gone forever, and the translators had to invent new characters. So what would Joseph Smith do when he ran into these lacunas, these holes here, that had no characters? He would take characters from another scroll, and he would fill in the blanks. Since Joseph Smith by himself knew nothing about the Egyptian language, how is he going to make these figures that he doesn't understand fit with the translation? Undoubtedly, the scroll in which he's translating the book of Abraham is going to have the same problem. These are very old scrolls. You're going to run into lacunas. How is he going to fill in these blanks in order to continue the translation? Wouldn't this explain why they were taking characters from the book of the dead here in order to fill in those lacunas? Perhaps there wasn't enough figures here to fill in those lacunas, so they had to add and fill in the lacuna here with new figures. So perhaps according to an order, they put these into the next scroll. So now you've filled in these lacunas with new characters, which gives you new reference points for the English over here. This would explain why they would take this first character right here and put it over in the margin and line it up with the scroll and the English writing. Or take this character and line it up over here. You only need to match one or two characters because you already knew the sequence written down somewhere else of all these new characters. So by what the English translation was saying over here, you might get a better reference point between the new characters and the old characters to line up an understanding. Not knowing Egyptian, they might have thought that they could match each English word with each character over here by how they matched up by the same count from each margin. And of course, if it was simply an unknown character to fill in the lacuna here, it wouldn't matter. They could even make up a character, hoping the right one would be discovered later in another matchup with the English. So two things are happening here. He's receiving this information by revelation over here in English, from which becomes the hopeful pathway to make a kind of Rosetta Stone over here. But on the other hand, on an intellectual level, they hope to connect what's on the scroll over here directly to the English revelation over here in order to create an Egyptian alphabet system. In other words, Joseph Smith and his scribes were trying to do what the Rosetta Stone does. Let's say the English word is Abraham. So we automatically follow it over here and assign this figure, this hieroglyph, as Abraham and put it right here in the margin, marking the exact line that connects the two languages. This would explain why these characters are placed in odd, unusual places, because you're trying to line up with the new characters that don't have definitions yet. Or why this scribe wrote way out of the margin here, anticipating that characters would have to fit in this blank spot. A lot of people noticed that this character was erased and then moved up. It was more important to line it up with the scroll here than it was to line it up with the English. And even though these characters might be wrong, you might be able to find a match somewhere else and line it up to the English and find out what it actually is. The anti-Mormons are trying to make you think that Joseph Smith and the scribes wrote the entire book of Abraham from these few characters in the Book of the Dead here. Well, Joseph Smith and his scribes were not that dumb to make the world think that they did that. The only reason they would use these characters is to fill in lacunas. People notice that the character doesn't always match with the English over here. It's in the middle of the sentence. 
but over here it's lined up perfectly with the Egyptian. Now what probably happened there was they already placed that character before Joseph even started translating. They already had that character and they were careful to align it up to the scroll first. Then when Joseph Smith translated it, it didn't line up at all with the paragraph. The only possible reason that the scribes were placing these characters in all these inordinate places was because there was a scroll of Abraham. There was a missing scroll that we don't have. Otherwise, they just wouldn't be doing something that looks so ridiculous over here. There had to be a reason. They believed that Joseph Smith was actually translating by the power of the Lord, or they wouldn't have been going to all this effort to try to prove it. So because we don't have the scroll today, the critics sit around and laugh at this arrangement. It just doesn't make any sense. It looks ridiculous without the realization that there was a real scroll. Did the Lord really expect Abraham to teach the Egyptians biblical words written in a non-biblical language and understanding? So we need to see a separation and a duality between the Egyptian understanding in orange and the Hebrew understanding in white. Joseph Smith says this is the scepter or the power of the priesthood. In the Egyptian understanding, it's Ammon Ray who has that power and scepter. Down here we have the four corners of the earth, as far as the Egyptians understand it, and also the four corners of the earth with the Hebrew. So all around the clock we're getting this duality. But the Egyptologists will not recognize the Hebrew understanding, only Egyptian, and they therefore will say Joseph Smith got it wrong. So is there a way to know that Joseph Smith knew how to convert Egyptian characters into a Hebrew understanding? How can we prove this? Did ancient prophets take words and symbols and convert them into something else that was no longer recognized? The book of Revelation was originally written in the Greek language. John the Revelator took a familiar word and changed its entire meaning. He encrypted it, and he gave it a brand new definition, which no one has been able to understand in over 2,000 years. When the book was later translated into English, the Greek word in English became the word beast. But you see, it wouldn't make any difference if you translated it from Greek to English. You still wouldn't understand an encrypted word, regardless of what language it's translated into. So irregardless whether it's the Greek word or the English translation, it still makes no sense. And even if you take this word back to the book of Daniel, which was written in Aramaic, it still has no definition and it still is encrypted in three different languages. No one knows what it means. John dissects the word beast into five degrees of understanding. The beast has seven heads. The beast is a leopard. The beast is like a bear. The beast is like a lion. The beast has great authority in the earth. So the Greek word beast has five letters. The English word beast has five letters. So you dissect the word into five degrees, and you still cannot understand what this is talking about. So over centuries of millions of people trying to define the word beast, no one can figure it out. Unless a prophet of God, through revelation, can define the word beast, we may have no understanding for the rest of the book here. He said it was not essential in his day to understand the beast, but Joseph said, still it may be necessary to prevent contention and division and do away with the suspense. Is he about to reveal it? Correct knowledge is necessary to cast out that spirit. Here Joseph gives us the correct knowledge in a general conference meeting. Now Joseph reveals what the Bible doesn't tell us. Talking about the kingdoms of the world, it is there for the inhabitants whereof who are the beastly and abominable characters. They were murderers, corrupt carnivores, and brutal in their dispositions. Here Joseph Smith reveals the key to understand John's beast that never has been revealed in the past. It is the people who are given over to that fallen evil nature, the natural man who follows Satan in the image of the beast. In the book of Daniel, we have Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which starts out with Babylon, which expands into five degrees of history, which is measured or encrypted by these animal figures, which no one understood. But now Joseph Smith tells us it's the inhabitants of those kingdoms, which is what we calculate. So let's decrypt the beast by taking Joseph Smith's revelation and change it into man's fallen nature and see if the rest of these degrees now make sense. So Joseph Smith decodes the beast, a cipher for man's carnal nature. Does it fit? A lion with great authority. Is that about power-hungry men? 
Three, seven heads and kingly horns. Is that political corruption that stems from man's fallen nature? The leopard attacks your back, a backbiter, a betrayal of trust, the deceit from evil intentions to snare others by camouflage. The leopard is camouflaged, so is man. The bear, people who throw their weight around, who impose upon your rights and freedoms to empower themselves. Is this not already depicted in Nebuchadnezzar's dream? The head of Babylon turns into a lion. The breast turns into a bear. The belly into a leopard. The answer was there and nobody saw it. Did ancient prophets take words and symbols and convert them into something else that was no longer recognized? Daniel and John and Joseph Smith invented words and characters and assigned them with new definitions. So for right now, they give these phantom characters right here a correct definition with the translation over here. Even though all these phantom characters are wrong and some are even made up just to fill in the gaps. Hoping later to find the correct character when they can find a great match. By knowing where this is, they know the correct character and its location where it's going to go. So after receiving the English Revelation, maybe they could attach the right character to it. The Egyptologists tell us that this character right here relates to Osiris of Egypt. Joseph Smith was redefining that character to mean Abraham. Remember, Abraham was told by the Lord to teach the future of Israel only. Did ancient prophets encrypt any name that they wanted and redefine it to mean something else entirely? Why would they do that? Did the Lord really expect Abraham to teach the Egyptians biblical words written in a non-biblical language and understanding? Quite the same as Joseph Smith taking these Egyptian characters and converting them into a Hebrew biblical message over here. He was doing this with many other characters. Joseph Smith would take a character like this and expand it into five degrees to explain it. It was almost like creating a whole new dictionary explanation could be that they expanded these five degrees to make the Egyptian fit better with the English. I think Oliver Cowdery realized that when he said you could fill up volumes with far less Egyptian characters. I think he figured that out from this process because nobody knew anything about Egyptian in his day. This is the original alphabet and grammar book right here. This is where they ended and gave up right here. I think they realized that it just wasn't going to work. Look at this. They only filled up a small tiny part of the book. You can see that they were just not messing around. They were trying really hard to make this alphabet actually work. I don't think this could have worked to make a Rosetta type stone to match the two languages because it took less meaning for the Egyptian language than it would for the English language to express itself. There's a problem with the correlation here. They ran into these lacunas, these holes, these places where there was no writing like the Dead Sea Scrolls, who ran into the same problem. They had almost the same challenge with the Dead Sea Scrolls. There were dozens of lacuna gaps or holes where the language was gone forever, and the translators had to invent new characters. They thought these characters might fill in the gaps until much later they could fill in the right characters and links. So for right now, they give these phantom characters right here a correct definition with the translation over here. Even though all these phantom characters are wrong, and some are even made up just to fill in the gaps, hoping later to find the correct character when they can find a great match. By knowing where this is, they know the correct character and its location where it's going to go. At no time did the Lord command them to use the scrolls to figure out the Egyptian language, but he obviously let them try their plan. Now, Robert Rittner was on John DeLynn's show, and he identified this figure right here as an altar. Well, Joseph Smith identified that as an altar. To me, it looks just like a flower vase or something. But Joseph Smith, having no understanding of Egyptian, recognized that as an altar. And I know it's true because... Robert Rittner said it was. The difference was Joseph Smith was taking something that was Egyptian and converting it into something that was Hebrew. In other words, this was Abraham's altar, not Osiris or anybody else. So he was converting what the Egyptians apparently got wrong back into what it should be. So it's easy for somebody like Rittner to sit there and say that Joseph Smith got all this wrong, not knowing that he was converting. He was retranslating it into a biblical understanding. From the text, we are told that the Egyptians wanted to kill Abraham because he was teaching something completely opposite from what they were teaching. 
So if these Egyptian priests hated Abraham that bad that they wanted to kill him, would they not also destroy his writings if they could get a hold of them or if they could read them? Therefore, would not Abraham, like John the Revelator, need to encrypt his writings so that no one could be able to decipher it until the latter days and Joseph Smith? So in Abraham 3 verse 4, the Lord is not telling Abraham to teach the Egyptians about astronomy at all. He's telling him to teach them about his posterity as an object lesson using the stars. This is about his posterity and the priesthood. I give you the numbers 9 through 11. 11, 11, 11, 11, 11. Joseph Smith says he wants the whole world to find out what these numbers 9 through 11 mean. Why are not the scholars interested in this? In the very same video, come and learn how the missing scroll of Amenhotep from the Book of Abraham gave us the timeline of the patriarchal priesthood of the Egyptian birthright found in the mummies of King Onidas and his princess, and how the same timeline reveals the same time period of the patriarchal priesthood from Adam, Noah, and Abraham by the heavenly stars with Hebrew names that you see here. So the heavenly bodies are the clock that keep time for the prophets upon the earth. Each prophet has his own time period or dispensation. Come and see how Robert Rittner was wrong about Joseph's translation of the four gods of Horus. Come see why Abraham seated here on the throne means all the Egyptian figures here must be replaced by Hebrew figures. And see why the names are not wrong after all. Let me show you how they deceived you about facsimile 1 also. For all the phony scholarship claims made by Joseph Smith's critics who post videos and write books, they failed to explain any credible academic reasons explaining why the scribes and Joseph Smith were doing what they were doing, as I have today in this video. They have manufactured a conspiracy theory that doesn't even make sense or doesn't exist. They have nothing to offer you. They tell you Joseph Smith was a womanizer, he's a fraud, he's a criminal. They repeat it over and over again, hoping you'll believe it. Click my name, Paul Gregerson, and let me prove to you how you've been lied to, especially my videos titled LDS Transaction Lawsuits right here. Click Paul Gregerson. If I can't prove to you that you've been lied to, I will publicly apologize to you. Thank you very much. There's a lot of critics out there that are trying very hard to confuse you, but they have nothing to offer you, folks. They can repeat the same thing a hundred times, but that doesn't make it true. If Joseph Smith is truly a prophet of God and has given me the right definition of the beast in the book of Revelation, then I will be able to connect the right dots and resolve the entire mystery. I'm challenging you in this YouTube video to discover that I have resolved and solved the world's greatest Bible mystery. Come see.